Good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you today. For those of you I haven't yet met, my name is Justin, one of the pastors here at Aletheia. We're beginning a brand new teaching series this morning entitled Jesus Plus Therapy. And a few comments on what we are going to be doing in this series and what we're not going to be doing in this series. First of all, you'll notice it's not entitled Jesus Versus Therapy. And we believe in the help and the benefit and the blessing of good therapy. That that can be helpful. And I myself have engaged the services of a godly therapist. And it's been incredibly, incredibly helpful. And so these aren't, aren't two things to be pitted against each other. No way, shape, or form. Having said that, we're not going to be diving into the modern, most, you know, advanced therapeutic techniques and understanding that. I'm not qualified to speak on that. Uh, so we're, we're not going to be looking at, okay, what are, what are the latest and greatest things in therapy when it comes to addressing mental health? So here's what we are going to be doing. We're going to be talking about, from the scriptures, what it looks like to bring your mental health and your emotional life to Jesus and to allow him to be your capital T therapist. Because for a follower of Jesus, it has to be Jesus plus therapy. It can never be therapy alone, because Jesus is actually called the Wonderful Counselor. And He is meant to be the one to whom we first and foremost bring our emotional life, our souls, all of who we are. And therapy is a helpful, godly blessing, but it has to be in addition to the ministry of Jesus in and through our lives. So we're going to be looking at four different topics over the coming four weeks, and we're going to begin today by looking at anxiety. And we're going to go back to the scene of the crime and the root of anxiety, so you can open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3, Genesis is the first book in your Bible, very easy to find, and we're going to read chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. You can follow along in a Bible or in a Bible app. If you are reading in a Bible app on your phone, I'm going to be reading out of the English version, uh, sorry, the English Standard Version. Yeah, as if I know how to read any other language version. Uh, So if you select that translation, you'll be able to follow along word for word. I'm going to read for us, we'll pray, then we'll dive in. Genesis 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask that he would guide us in it today. Heavenly Father, we need you to do something about this problem in our lives, in our city, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our families. So God, we're not just asking for a little bit of personal insight. We're asking for a transformation. God, a new way to see things and a new work that you do to free us from the bonds of anxiety. Would you be present with us by your Holy Spirit to guide us into all the truth today? It's in Jesus' name that we say, amen. Let's first talk about what we mean when we use the word anxiety. And a helpful source for this is 
Wikipedia, of all things. Well footnoted definition. Here's what Wikipedia says anxiety means. Anxiety is an emotion which is characterized by an unpleasant state of inner turmoil and includes feelings of dread over anticipated events. I like to think about it like an undercurrent or a subterranean river in your life of fear and worry. Now, this is different from fear. Fear can actually be really, really helpful. Fear tells us when to move out of the way when something harmful is about to happen. So you can think about it this way. Fear tells you that when you're walking along a sidewalk and you look up and there's an, a window unit about to fall out of a window, fear tells you to you know, run the other way or stay or don't, don't walk. Fear can be very, very helpful in that situation. Anxiety is walking around thinking that every single AC window unit is going to fall on you at any moment, at any time, at any place on the block. It's an undercurrent of fear. Now, I, I don't need to tell you this, that anxiety is widespread. It's an experience that, that we've all had. But it's also, I, you know, Pastor Quentin had you fill out your connection cards earlier. By far and away, the most mentioned prayer request that we pray for as a staff on a Monday morning is feelings of anxiety. This is something that people are dealing with. It's something that we are dealing with. And it's something that is kind of a very common experience, but it should never be a normalized experience. Time and again in the scriptures, the Bible says we don't need to be anxious. Philippians chapter 4, do not be anxious about anything. So it is actually possible to address anxiety in such a way that you do not need to be anxious, which is news to many. It might be news to you, but this is a wonderful, hopeful thing. But it doesn't come by ignoring it or distracting yourself from it or running away and hope it, hoping it doesn't get after you. It comes from handling it in the way that the Bible calls us to handle it. And here's what I think we learn that we must do from this story. That we must reject anxiety's call to seek godly desires in godless ways. We must reject anxiety's call to seek godly desires in godless ways. Anxiety always issues a call. And here's what I mean. If you look at what the serpent says, when it comes up to the man and the, wo and the woman, we can actually see what this voice sounds like. And I want to show this to you. He said to the woman, the serpent said to the woman, Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, it sounds like an innocent question. But if you look back at Genesis chapter 2 at what God actually said, I want you to notice the difference. So here's what God actually said. You may, speaking to the humans, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. You notice the difference? The snake asks, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree? From the get-go, the serpent tries to introduce a feeling of anxiety through a feeling of deficiency. A feeling of lack. That, oh, you don't have something that you need. By painting God in this light of actually withholding, when in reality what was happening, it was lavish generosity. Did God actually say you're not allowed to eat of any tree in the garden? Anxiety is a feeling of not having what you need. It's an undercurrent, a subterranean river in your life where you're constantly in a state of feeling like you don't have what you need. But the serpent doesn't stop there. This trend continues. This feeling, this sound, this tone of deficiency. What does she say? So, so she answers and says, no, no, no. Um, God said we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Quick note. Is that what God actually said? He said, no, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. The woman has already begun to buy what the serpent is selling. Already giving in to the feeling of, oh, I am deficient in, in something. So the serpent responds. 
The serpent said, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Now this is interesting. Implied in this message that your eyes will be opened is the message that your eyes are closed. Feeling of deficiency. You lack something. God is keeping something from you. Your eyes are closed and you just need your eyes open so you can finally get what you need. But he doesn't stop there. Your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Implied message, ooh, you're lacking something in your identity. You're not like God. Mm, you're a little less than. You are deficient. Knowing good and evil. There's something you don't know. That's the implied message. So whereas God was lavishly generous, saying you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, the serpent comes in and tries to bring a tone of deficiency. Ooh, your eyes are closed. There's something you don't see. Mm, you're not quite enough like God. Oh, there's something you lack in your identity. And you need to know good and evil. There's something you don't know. And we must reject anxiety's call. And it's in, it's in, the, the reason I call it anxiety's call is that anxiety is always trying to get you to do something. So the serpent points their attention to the tree in the midst of the garden. Now this really kind of shifted my paradigm. I always envisioned the, this conversation happening just right by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's how I envisioned it in my mind. That they're like standing right by the tree. Serpent has the conversation. Woman reaches out and grabs the fruit without, without thinking or moving or anything like that. But one of the commentators that I read really changed this, pic, this picture. When the serpent asks her, is this what God said? And she responds and says, well, he told us not to eat from the tree in the midst of the garden. It must be that they're not standing by the tree. Because she says, oh yeah, that tree over there. But the serpent wants to get their attention on that tree. What does Satan do to Jesus when he tempts him in the, in the wilderness? The first temptation, he says, hey, look at these rocks. Those could be bread. Anxiety always wants to call your attention to something that will be... Uh, claimed to be able to actually meet your need. So the serpent says, oh, you're deficient in this thing. Your eyes are closed. You don't know good and evil. You're, you're not quite enough like God. But look at this tree in the midst of the garden. That could be the thing that you can actually get your needs met from. It's a call to bring your attention to something. But it's a counterfeit. Now here's the great irony of this. So we must reject anxiety's call to seek godly desires in godless ways. There's an irrational irony about what they're going after. So it says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Did God care about their need for food? Absolutely. Is their need for food something that is bad is that desire to, to eat something that, that, that is arbitrary and strange and wrong? No. In fact, it's a need that God had provided for. You may surely eat of every tree in the garden. They're actually opting for something that is far less than what God had provided for them. It's a godly desire. Then it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes... Where are they standing? They're standing in the Garden of Eden. The word Eden, one of the translations, is delight. They're standing and staring at one tree when the, all of their surroundings are a delight to the eyes. But their focus and their attention is grabbed by this one counterfeit thing. The serpent has convinced them that they can only get delight from this one tree when delight is everywhere around them. And this is the silliest one of all, to be honest. When the serpent says, you will be like God. The humans are made in God's image. How much more like God can they become? <laughs> Genesis chapter 1 says, God made man and woman in his image. The great irrational irony about this is that they are like God. God. 
They are imagers of him. They reflect his character and his goodness and represent his rule. They're like God in every way that matters. God made them to be like him. But the serpent has convinced them that, oh, they actually, this likeness, their identity, what they really need comes from this tree. Then it also says, and that it, the tree, was desired to make one wise. Now this connects with the knowing good and evil. Did God care that they would become wise? Of course. You don't have to read the Bible for very long to figure out that God cares that people are wise. Proverbs 30, like the entire book of Proverbs, is evidence that God cares about making his people wise. But what was the difference? They wanted to be wise on their own terms. And they're taking these godly desires that they have, and the serpent has convinced them to go and satiate their appetite, but in godless ways. They want God's stuff without God. It says that the woman saw that the tree was good for food. In Genesis 1 and 2, we're told time and again that God has been the source and the definer of what is good. It says, and God saw what he had made, and behold, it was good. Then God looks over everything that he has made and says, behold, it was very good. But the woman looks at something, and the man looks at something and says, you know what? This fruit from this tree, this is good. They want to define for themselves what is good and bad. This is really about autonomy. This is not about them wanting to be more intelligent than God. This is them wanting to define good and bad for themselves. They want to seek godly desires in godless ways. And we must learn from this cautionary tale not to do that. There's a, they actually get what the snake promised them. And you know, when you seek godly desires in godless ways, you might get what you want. But it will be exposed as a counterfeit that will ultimately fail you. And this is exactly what happens with the first humans. So they, they get what the snake promises. But instead of it actually meeting their needs, it spells disaster for them. Their eyes are actually opened. But instead, they notice that they are naked and ashamed. They get what the snake promised, but it's tragedy, not fulfillment. They now know good and evil, but they realize that they are evil. They were promised something, but when the snake actually delivers on his promise, it is rotten fruit, rotten from the inside. And when we seek godly desires in godless ways, that's exactly what happens. It's a bait and switch. And whereas the snake says, you will be like God, the the, the tragic irony is that once they sin against God, their very imageness of God is broken because of sin. You might even get what the snake promised us. But the reason that you have to reject that call is because what the snake is selling is tragedy and destruction and chaos, and it's exactly what you don't want. We must reject anxiety's call to seek godly desires in godless ways. There's an inversion that the author is showing us here. Whereas in Genesis 1 and 2, here we have the order of God defines what is good makes a man and a woman to rule over the animals. Now we begin with a snake who lies and the woman who believes it and the man who gives into the deception as well and they decide what is good and then, then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. And he calls out, he says, where are you? But they hid themselves because they were naked and ashamed. We must reject anxiety's call to seek godly desires in godless ways. Let's reflect on how to apply this then. If this is a major cautionary tale, and yes, it is. (laughs) What do we need to do in response to this? So we've seen that we must reject anxiety's call. How then do we reject anxiety's call? I'm going to give you 
four things, and here's the first one. We reject anxiety's call by first, we, so we, we must reject anxiety's call by discontenting ourselves with anxiety. We must discontent ourselves with anxiety. This is the first one. Anxiety is a very common experience, but it should never be an acceptable experience for a follower of Jesus. And what tends to happen is that when we feel anxiety and we feel the undercurrent, that subterranean river of worry and fear in our lives, I don't know, what I tend to do is distract myself. Go watch a show. Go do some exercise. Distract myself away from the fear and that undercurrent that's going on. Now, to discontent ourselves with anxiety is not to run away from it and not to ignore it. It's to face it full in the face, just like Jesus did in the, wil- in the wilderness. But it's to say, okay, this is a normal experience, but it should not be normalized in my life. Ther- uh, therapists will often talk about how we ought to become friends with anxiety. But what they don't mean by that, or they shouldn't mean by that, is that we should be okay to keep it around. It means that we need to look it full in the face and deal with it. So right now, in your life, you need to decide that the gift of God, of His peace, to replace your anxiety is something you want to take hold of. And say, you you know what, I'm not content to live with anxiety in my life. I don't need to, I don't want to, so I'm not going to. And the reason you have to do that is because it's going to be a battle. And it's going to require effort of you in order to push back. It's going to be taxing, just like it was for for Jesus facing the temptation of Satan in the wilderness. But we must discontent ourselves with anxiety. Second, we must recognize distortions about God and us. Recognize distortions about God and us. The serpent slithers up and presents a picture of God that is false and does so in an innocent way, just asking a question, leading question, presenting God as withholding and greedy rather than what is true about him, which is that he is lavishly generous. Of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. We must recognize when distortions about God are being presented. And this is... This is a helpful way just to like do some self-talk. Like when thoughts come into your mind that make you anxious, stop and ask, what is this saying about God? What is this feeling telling me about God? What will often happen is that it's pretty easy to recognize. I mean, like, oh, this is telling me that God is like greedy and not willing to provide for my needs. Oh, this is telling me that God is like an absentee landlord who checks in every now and then but doesn't care about the small details of my life. These thoughts and feelings will present a picture of God that you have to learn how to put through the grid of the scriptures and throw out what is false. But then you also need to recognize when it's presenting a distorted picture of you. What does the snake do about the humans? He gives implicit, insidious messages that they are deficient as God's imagers. And you need to learn to recognize the difference between God's voice and when the serpent is aiming to make you feel deficient by what you are. Now, does, does this mean that you're, you should just always only ever receive thoughts like from your middle school teacher who told you that you were the wonderful, the most best and brightest and you can do nothing wrong? No. No. The scriptures will give you an accurate picture of yourself. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a sinner saved by grace, which means you're not going to do everything right all the time. But when the feelings come in and say, you know what, I am insufficient. No, in Christ you are sufficient. In Christ you find your sufficiency. When those feelings come in that make you feeling less than not just who you are in what your middle school teacher described you as, but less than what Christ says, is true about you. We must recognize distortions about God and us. Third, we must look away from the counterfeit gods. We must look away from the counterfeit gods. We're told that the woman looking at the tree saw that it was good 
for food. She is staring at that tree. And when anxiety comes to call in your life, it's always trying to point your attention to something that you need, quote unquote, in order to truly satiate your desires and your needs. And what we need to learn to do is to recognize what that thing is. Maybe it's a person, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a habit, maybe it's an action, a decision. It it could be anything. And usually those things are not bad in and of themselves, but we're meant to seek those godly desires in godly ways, and we need to learn to turn from them. Let me give you an example. Maybe you're super anxious, and your attention on the, on the fact is like, you know what, I just need to go and take a vacation. I just need to go and travel. Is there anything wrong with travel? No, absolutely not. If you do not have the money in your bank account to go and travel, and you need to go into a bunch of debt in order to fund a trip so you can finally just feel fine, hmm, maybe it's time to get your eyes off of that Expedia ad on TV that tells you, oh, you can... The only place to breathe, apparently, is on a beach. You know, you can find God's peace anywhere. I, I can't help but think of Joseph in a dungeon sold by his brothers for two years living in the peace of God. If Joseph can do it, you can do it. You have the Holy Spirit and you have Christ, you can do it. We must learn to recognize what God's enemy is trying to get us to focus on as a counterfeit God, and we must learn to turn away from it. That's side one of the coin. What's the second side? This brings us to our fourth application. We must be with the God of peace. I love this. In, in, Ro- in Romans, Paul calls God the God of peace. It says in verse 8, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The one whose image they were, the one who was in fact good to make them wise, the one who was the ultimate source of delight was right there. And what they needed to do was to reject the serpent's craftiness and to go be with the one who made them, and who, the one who could truly fulfill them. The same is true for us. You reject the counterfeits and you go after the real thing. And you need to be with him. How do you be with him? Through his word and through prayer. If we're meant to recognize distortions of God, how do you recognize distortions? It's when you know the real thing. And there's no way to get around knowing the real thing but immersing yourself in these scriptures. Personally, as part of a small group, here in corporate worship, the more you know the Scriptures, the more you can recognize perversions of God, distortions of His image. You know, God doesn't need you to read the Bible. He's good. He's fine. God has given you the gift of the Scriptures to help you know who He is. But it's not just about knowing about Him, it's about knowing Him. That you can actually encounter the God of peace in the scriptures. And guess what? The more you know him, the easier it is to recognize distortions. Do you know who, uh, just like in your life, the people you spend the most time with and the people you know the best, the the easiest it is to recognize distortions of them. If If somebody comes to me and starts misrepresenting my wife, I'll recognize it immediately. Why? Because I know her. I know her really, really well. Recognizing distortions about God comes through knowing His Word, but knowing Him. And that comes through prayer. Prayer. You're like, yeah, a pastor telling me to pray. That's like just the oldest trick in the book. You know, God doesn't need you to pray. God has given you the gift of prayer because we need it. And here's what happens in prayer. One of my favorite Bible words of what happens in prayer is that We magnify the Lord. We magnify God. That when we behold Him and we, through prayer, recount who He is, He grows bigger in our minds and our hearts. 
He grows larger, more significant. He fills the aspect of our vision. And this, is, this goes exactly what, against what the serpent is trying to do. His words try to minimize God, tries to distance him. And when we pray, as Jesus instructed us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We are magnifying him in our hearts and our minds and souls such that it pushes the lies and the distortions out of the way and we can see him as he truly is. Be with the God of peace. Now there's bad news and there's good news. The bad news is that even if you do all four of these things perfectly, if you discontent yourself with anxiety, recognize distortions, look away from the counterfeit gods, and even be with God, it's not enough. It's not enough. And here's why. Our first parents got themselves into a position where they needed God's help to get out of it. And we all are born with our ears finely tuned to the voice of the serpent. We've all fallen prey to his deceptions and his lies. And we've all worshipped counterfeit gods and rejected the true knowledge of God because of sin. And it's not about us perfectly applying ourselves to these principles. Just like our first parents, we need God to come in and act in a saving way. And that's exactly what God did. That he made a promise to our first parents that an offspring would come from the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. And I want you to pick, I just want you to picture a serpent. What was the most dangerous part of the serpent for our first parents? It was the serpent's mouth. The mouth out of which lies came and de- deception flowed. And this offspring would crush not just its head, but by merit of its mouth being in its head, would crush its mouth. And then God killed an animal or two and covered their shame in animal skins. And you only need to read the New Testament for a little bit to know what that's talking about. That the offspring of the woman has come in the person of Jesus Christ. And though his heel was bruised when he died on the cross, it crushes the head of the serpent. And here, here's why. Because all you need to do is think about what God has done for you in Jesus and it totally defangs the serpent. All our first parents needed to do was to think back to what God has said through his word that he is in fact lavishly generous and we have something better than they had. We have his word made flesh. That God has sent Jesus Christ to come to the world. He is the lamb who was slain in order to take away our sin. And all you need to do is think about Jesus for a split second to realize that the lies of the serpent are bogus. That they are, it rips the the carpet out from the lies of the serpent and restores you to the true knowledge about God. That God has done everything necessary in his son to save you. And when you either encounter that for the first time through faith in Jesus, or you revisit it every day, every morning, every time you feel anxious, every time you find yourself walking around feeling like a window unit is going to fall on you, and you remember, wait a minute. The God who made me has done everything necessary to save me. What else could it mean but that he loves me more than I could imagine? This is what God has done to free us from anxiety. And I don't know where this lands for you, this morning, I imagine in a room of this size in many different places. What I want you to hear this morning is the hope of the Word of God that you don't have to live an anxious life. But maybe you're in here and you haven't put your faith in Jesus who crushes the head of the serpent. And my encouragement to you would be receive Jesus as your Lord and, sa- as your Lord and Savior. We've all given in to the voice of the serpent, but the solution isn't you doing better. To you putting your faith in the one who has crushed the serpent's head. Maybe you are in here and you've found yourself extremely anxious. This morning is a moment to remember what God has done for you, but also to find help in prayer. We're going to have people on the sides of the room 
uh, during our response moment and after the service who would love to pray for you. We all need help with this. This isn't something we can do alone. We need to bind together as a spiritual family in order to walk in the victory that Christ has won for us. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the hope of your word. That we don't need to live in fear, but that we can live free from it. Lord, I pray that we would walk in the victory that Christ has won for us. Lord, we agree along with the scriptures that you have disarmed the principalities and powers, that you have crushed the head of the serpent, and that we are not victorious because of our efforts, but because of merit of being in Christ. Lord, we receive that victory this morning. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room who feel extremely anxious, who have felt anxious this week. My prayer is that you would walk them into freedom this morning that they would feel different today than they have felt not just all week, but all year. That they would walk in a new sense of victory, in a new experience of freedom, in the confidence that their God loves them and is for them. God, I pray as we remember Christ in this moment, that we would receive the peace that surpasses all understanding, that it would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's in his name that we say, amen.